Um, so, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have a very exciting education panel here. Um, so, first of all, I would like to introduce our chair of today. Uh, is Amy from uh, Michael Bits, and um, she would basically, uh, you know, ask uh, the panelists questions. And at the end, we'll have a section for Q and A. Hopefully, if we have time. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I would let uh, Amy take us away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Amy Fagan from the Microbit Educational Foundation. So for those of you not familiar with the Microbit, it's a tiny programmable computer designed for education. We've got a fantastic brand new Python editor that's going to be launched in about two months' time. And you can get a preview of that downstairs uh, in the uh, main forum room. So that's my little plug over with. Uh, I'm going to hand uh, pass along the panel now to introduce our speakers. So I'll go to you first. Hi everyone, my name is Roisin Faherty. I'm a lecturer in computer science in TU Dublin on the Tala campus. And I'm also part of a research group called CS Inc, which stands for Computer Science Inclusive. And as part of that group, I go out to both primary and secondary schools, but more lately, more secondary schools, doing outreach in computer science. Uh, I'm Sarah Jane Carey. I'm a computer science teacher in Cloughter Breed, which is a large girls' school in Clondalkin. Um, computer science is a new subject for the Leaving Cert. was introduced four years ago. So this will be the first year that we'll have non-COVID proper run at the course. Um, I also work with other pre-service teachers to help them to teach computer science. And in terms of Python, um, I actually did a Python course with Vicky about 12 years ago to try and teach myself over a weekend. Before computer science was there, I used to do a makey-uppy project-based type thing um, with my students once a week. And I went in to try and you know, improve my learning. Um, so I literally started learning Python to teach my students. So I'm coming at it like I'm enthusiast now, but I'm still just a beginner, really, just a learner and use it to teach the course. So I'm delighted to be here. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Reyna. So I have a company called Maker Meet. We are makers. You probably might see us downstairs. We have all of the flammable cardboard, um, uh, which is running a Python game. And uh, we do maker-based education. So we do STEAM workshops and things in both primary, secondary, third level, and beyond, sometimes even preschool, things like that. Uh, so a lot of what we do is trying to incorporate many different things of STEAM into one project, and no more than our project downstairs, which is all cardboard uh, with a bit of paper as a screen, but it is running uh, a Raspberry Pi with Python on it. So we try to mix stuff up as much as possible in doing project-based learning. Thanks, Chris. And we've also got Kelly. Hi, Kelly, joining us remotely. Oh, we don't have sound for Kelly, I don't think. My fad, <laughs> habit of keeping on my mute. Hi, everyone. I am Kelly Schuster Paredes, and I'm a teacher that codes. I am coming from sunny South Florida, where I'm a middle school teacher, and we teach Python to 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. And um, some of you may know me as the co-host of the Teaching Python podcast with Sean Tiber. And I started coding about four years ago, and I like to tell everybody I'm really good at teaching kids basic Python. So that's my story. Amazing. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you all for being here, both in person and remote. It's great to be here in Dublin at the beautiful Convention Centre. So to kick us off, I'm going to ask um, a question to the group, and I'm going to pass you, Roisin, and go to you first. Um, <clears throat> but one of the original goals of the Python language was to be easy to learn and intuitive. Um, and these qualities, as I'm sure many of us understand it, it makes it a very effective programming language for education. Um, but I'd love to hear from each of you about your perspective on what other features you find work well in education. Well, I'll start, if that's okay. Go for it, yeah. Um, and I suppose I might take a slightly different slant on that question, if that's okay. So um, we use Python to teach CS1 in first year in TU Dublin. And we've had many debates in the department about which language to teach first, C, C++, Java, Python. At the moment, it is Python, and it does work well as an introductory programming language. 
But earlier this week, I was at a different conference, and it was very, very interesting to hear a comment from Titus Winters from Google. And he was talking about the gap between um, education and industry. And it made me think a little bit about the Python language. And while it is really simple for first year coding or CS1, um, a lot of the detail behind the code is hidden from the students. Just to give one example, you can define a variable and you don't have to know what data type that variable is, which is brilliant because there's no confusion for the students. But Titus's point was that when they get to industry, how fluent are they in the language? Yes, they can solve a problem, but are they solving it in the best way? So I suppose it throws up that question again, and I'm sorry, Amy, it's not really an answer, mm. but it throws up that question again, you know, Python is easy to learn and it's very intuitive and it works well for first year programming um, at third level. Um, but do we need to look at the bigger picture and where that fits in in, say, a four year degree um, program and how to ensure that by using Python in the early years, we also turn out graduates that are fluent in programming so that when they come into industry, um, they're able to do the jobs that are required of them. Mm. Yeah. That's me. Um, in secondary school, we would have students coming in to do computer science in fifth year, and uh, coding is available as a junior cycle subject. So some students, and that's in our school, it's not in every school, so some students might have been exposed to Python. If they've done coding, they'll all have been exposed to Scratch. Most schools try to do a bit of Scratch, and I know um, that there is Scratch in primary school, and they're doing great work in primary schools. Um, what I find is when they come into fifth year, I'll have a mixed bag of students. Some of them have never done coding before, and some of them maybe have done junior cycle coding, and then some of them might be real enthusiasts and are really big into coding themselves outside school. So you're trying to teach 25 students in a room like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of like Python because it's natural, it's English based, it's readable for them, particularly for the students who've never seen it before. So, and they can get quite advanced. And, and, and again, there's always that argument of, should we be educating students to prepare them for industry or for education's mm -hmm. sake, you know? So from my perspective, Python is a, re is a good language to start with because they can get quite far with it and then we can integrate it into other aspects of the course, like there's an embedded systems course, part mm -hmm. of the course, and they would use Microbit or Raspberry Pi, and we use Microbit in our school, but um, now that there is Python in the platform, we can use the block-based coding to kind of hammer home the concepts. They can see something happening on the microbit, the hands-on, that physical thing where, you know, you get the question, why are we doing this? And then I can say, well, you're doing that. So when you walk by this little bit of kit, an alarm will go off. Just a very simple example. But now that we can switch very easily in the platform from, my, from block code to Python, I can say to them now, look, this is what it looks like in Python. And it's not such a big gap when we get to actually do the Python section of the course, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, so I would, um, I suppose my love of Python comes from, again, as, as everybody has said, in terms of the simplicity of using it and the ease of use to get into. So I suppose I deal with all levels, so primary, secondary, and even third level. Um, in Ireland, anyway, certainly, unfortunately, um, really Python is, or any text-based language, is rarely seen until the second level. My fervent hope is that because of Python's ease of use um, in education, as you were saying, it would be amazing to be able to pull that back to primary so that they can start very young, students can start very young doing block-based, whether it's Blockly, whether it's Scratch, it doesn't matter, and then move to a text-based language like Python. Um, yeah, the, the arguments that Roisin said are absolutely true. You know, is it, you know, is it appropriate for industry? Well, yes it is, but it's also a tool like any other. Python is absolutely appropriate for certain tasks. Java is appropriate for others. CSS, HTML, whatever language you want to choose is appropriate. You know, does it tie into databases very well? Uh, you could argue that, okay? But in terms of education, the other bonus for me is, um, as Sarah Jane pointed out, it's tie-in to IoT devices mm. or um, single board computer devices. So again, like the Microbit, like the Raspberry Pi, like lots of other boards. 
um, it ties directly to that. And for me, as a maker, introducing making and code, it's absolutely perfect to make that leap from block-based languages into text-based languages because it's just, it is that little bit easier to code than other languages are, in my opinion, obviously. <laughs> other people would probably disagree with me, but yeah, that's it, yeah, that's it, yeah. That's it. Thank you, Chris. Kelly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Well, I mirror a lot of the, lot of the comments that have already been made, but I have to say, I mean, this is my only language that I've ever coded, and coming from a non-computer science mm -hmm. background, um, this language just really took over my heart and uh, it became something that I really just loved. And it was the act of problem solving and critical thinking and finding something that I could connect to um, that helps me love Python. And that's what I bring with the students. And I find that the libraries themselves allow this diversity and this inclusivity in the classroom. I can pull kids in an interest that they like to be in. Um, I use the Pillow Library or Arcade or Turtle or MicroPython Library. And just that diversity of all these libraries that are easy to use, easy to access, you can give an eighth grader or a seventh grader this, this library and get them started is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then second point I'd have to make is the community. As a, as a teacher who knows, I always tell the kids, like 10% of this language, maybe 5%, I need, a, I need a support group. And the Twitter community has just been awesome. And all the people that we meet on the podcast, if I have an issue and I can't solve with a student, we tend to show the kids, hey, let's use social media. And, and the Twitter community just, of the Python um, family, they just, love to help out and so even silly problems that I just can't see the the debug in like one two minutes they're answering questions for 11 12 year olds so if you can imagine that power mm. of not only teaching Python but teaching that you can use your passions and you have a whole family to help you it's just amazing so that's what I love about Python yeah. amazing You're here. thank you Kelly any other reflections on what Kelly said there, guys, before we move on? No, I just think it's a great point. I think it's yeah. an absolutely great point, and it's something, even I have in my own notes here in terms of the libraries, that, again, that plug-in capability or the library's capability just for students also helps because it's the same in block-based coding. Fine, mm. you fire up Scratch. Well, look, you can pull the microbit libraries, you can pull any kind of library you like, and students understand that. And the same is true with Python. Do they understand it in a text-based language? No, not yet, but they will because they have something to relate it to. And that's just, yeah, absolutely, Kelly, absolutely, it's brilliant. And just even on, on the community aspect, as a teacher in secondary school, like there's a very small number of, of teachers, you know, who would have a computer science degree. I, like there's a very small number. Um, and we're looking for teachers to teach computer science. So. The fact that you can go on Twitter and ask a question. It's really like the computer science mm. community, the, yeah. the computer science teachers, the tech teachers community. They're so supportive and so helpful. Um, and like you could need that mid-class and, yeah. and literally get the answer by the end of class, yeah. which is amazing. I don't know any other subject area mm. where there is that support just from all over the world. Mm. You know, just a community of enthusiasts who are so passionate about it that they will help anyone to kind of spread the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It's fab. And what's, what I love about that is that, you're, that students are seeing that happening live yeah. mm -hmm. as you're doing it. And yeah. that's exactly what the community is all about, yeah. which is that's great. That's comforting to students as yeah, well, exactly. to know that they can get answers from yeah. a, a tremendously wider community. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 And to know that it's okay to ask, to see yeah. their teacher saying, I haven't a clue. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go on here and look yeah. this up. Pretty and somebody true. from somewhere will come up. Like, just to, to learn that it's okay not to know stuff and ask questions and somebody will help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's so empowering for the, for the students to yeah. see and, and to let them know that there's no way that any coder can know everything and that it's our job to be able to figure it out. And if it means calling on a friend in the, in the Twitterverse, then go for it. So, yeah. yeah, I have students in third level who would use the community a lot. And, you know, especially in first year, they're surprised when they get a response. Yeah. 
but the delight yeah. of it, yeah. and then, yeah. then, then they're hooked. They, and that makes my job yeah. so much easier, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Oh, I love it. Um, well, I think that's a nice kind of progression on to our next question, which is, and I'm going to start with you for this one, Kelly, is what are your favourite tools to teach Python? And, you know, what resources do you use? Um, do you find stuff online? What, and what maybe is missing right now? What have, have you been looking for anything that you can't yet find that this community might like to, to hear about as well? Well, we um, at my school, we make a lot of stuff up <laughs> as we go. So a lot of our is our own um, curriculum. Sure. But I do pull a lot of extra resources. I, I like to make these things called choice boards, and they allow students to learn in the way that they best see fit. For example, I will, I'll make my own screencast, but then I'll call upon Real Python short videos or some of the Real Python articles. Um, we use PyBytes, the newbie bytes, with Bob and Julian. We use the Moo editor. Um, and again, we use the Twitter community, but I find that you can find a lot of things out there, mm. but it just depends on the student and the learner. So we I provide a lot of choice on what they can find. Um, one other thing that's really good is the Grok Learning platform that mm. comes out of, I think, Australia. Yeah. And so right now I haven't found that there's too much, too much missing. Um, I do feel sometimes that the documentation is a little bit overwhelming to newbies, so I tend to avoid a lot of the documentation. But Microbit just came out with that, that great new editor with all the documentation kind of parsed out, and that seems to be something easier for the students to, to look over. I think when they go to that document and there's just text and no pictures, they kind of um, turn off that website right away, so I try to find videos and short short uh, tidbits for them. So. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Sarah Jane, how about you? Yeah, um, <coughs> again, we like the level we would go to is uh, probably really basic compared to her level or to all, to all you people in the audience here. Um, but we would use things like, um, like there's loads of stuff online, but if I was teaching it, there's, you know, there's a platform called techno.ie that does little bite-sized things that are kind of aligned to the course, and there's one on Python. Um, we'd use something like Code Club. We'd use the microbit resources to teach specific parts of it, and you're kind of pulling. It's similar to you, Kelly, actually. You're pulling and kind of creating your own course. And we have a book as well, this computer science book from Golden Key Publishing that goes through bits of it and then what I find is you put something in front of the students and they'll find their own stuff like that's what I like doing in class you know go and find a, a video on this and we use some of the you know the YouTube ones that you mentioned and um, so it's a kind of a mixture of everything and then we would have certain problems that we would have gotten in teacher training and um, CS Inc has a platform that goes through Python um, and HTML and all the different things that we would need for beginners and you can use those in class and the students can work at their own pace. Because computer science as a course is very project based and hands on and there's a lot of collaboration, there's not a lot of a student sitting there on their own. It's all group work. Um, so they tend to find what works for them and then we will share it with the class. Um, so yeah, there's lots out there and again, because similar to Kelly, like I don't know I probably don't know enough to know what I would like. You know, I yes. can't compare it to other languages where I can say, well, that's in that. I'd love if that was there, yeah. you know? Yeah, brilliant. What about you, Roisin? Yeah, echoing what everyone else has said, really, I suppose, um, two different hats on. One, the, the university hat, I would say, that very much like you, Kelly, we have our own curriculum. We build the resources for that curriculum for the students. And, and yes, they're drawn from lots of different areas. Um, we would also give supplementary material, things like W3 Schools is great That's as brilliant, well. Actually, yeah, yeah. yeah, for yeah. some exercises yeah. and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, we'd use lots of, of different resources, uh, different videos, and again, like, like you, Sarah Jane, I mean, the, the students tend to find things and share uh, yeah. as well with each other and with us, yeah. and then we pick out the best of that and, and, and follow through. Um, what I'd like to see, and I don't know if there's a tool like this out there, but I find um, from third level, probably one of the brick walls that our students come up against, aside from learning the language, is um, errors and how to navigate solving an error. So when I get an error, how do I fix that error? And if I get an error, how do I know what that error is? Mm. 
And I think it would be really nice if we had more tools using maybe AI or something that could direct the students to fixing those errors without giving them the answer, because we don't want that, but we want them to n not hit an error and go, oh my God, I can't make head or tail of this and step away from mm -hmm. it. Um, and I know from, uh, like say in primary school, they do three before me, you know, yeah. uh, and we would try and do that as well, three different things, but when they hit an error, they find that very difficult um, to navigate the solution to that. Um, tracing through, we go through and so on, but if there was a tool or built into Python that would direct them to solving that error, I think that would be amazing if we had something like that. So you've, you've heard it here first, everybody, if uh, anyone's working on anything. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Fantastic. Don't forget, there's, don't forget there's the you have the Python tutor. I don't know if you've ever seen that, where you can visualize the steps. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one was pretty good for debugging. That helped yeah. me actually <laughs> learn a lot. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. And we do use the debugging tools as well. But I don't know whether it's a mental block that students have. Mm. And again, remember, even though computer science, there's been, um, the Leaving Cert has run for a number of years now, we're still getting a lot of students on the course that may never have done coding for mm. or not be fully aware of computer science. So when it doesn't work and it stops and you get a box at the end with an error in it, it, I don't know if it's panic or roadblock or what, but they just tend to just stop. And even though you might show them de the debugging tools, they tend to be a little bit intimidated by that in first year and especially mm. in first semester. So it would be nice if there was something that handheld them through that initially. Mm. But yeah. Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or do you have a solution in mind? <laughs> um, well, interestingly, I, I, earlier this morning, I had a conversation uh, and it's a plug. If the guys are in the audience, great. If they're not, go have a look. I've only just met them this morning, so <laughs> full transparency. Um, but there's a group downstairs called Clean Code, and that is exactly what they're doing, <laughs> actually. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they have a debugging tool. It's not just for Python, okay. but it's for all languages. Um, and it's free for personal projects, which seems to cover a wide variety of projects, really. <laughs> so, um, and look, I only saw a demo, but it looked pretty cool, actually, to be honest. Um, in terms of tools uh, and things like that, I, I fully agree with Roshin in terms of like a built-in, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to say a built-in debugger, because, mm. but I also want just something, again, I'm thinking almost for younger students, yeah. not third level, not second level necessarily, <laughs> but something like that that would encourage them yeah in some way. Mm. I don't know what that is. I don't have an answer to that. But I absolutely agree with uh, W3Schools is yeah. brilliant. Um, what else did I put down? The Python themselves, the wiki, mm. Python's wiki, mm -hmm. is really, really good. It's a little bit text heavy maybe, but mm. yeah, still really good for finding information. Um, I really like uh, Developers Google, Python mm. site as well, mm. which is excellent. Uh, Codecademy as well, yeah, used yeah, as well, which is quite stepping through processes mm. as well. It was good mm -hmm. for kids. In terms of apps, um, Thonny, absolutely, uh, because it's cross-platform, brilliant things like that, and uh, my absolute go-to um, is Moo as well, as you, as you said as well, just Moo, um, and uh, I was lucky enough to meet my, my, the Moo creator, my hero, uh, who's sitting over there in the corner waving at the moment, so that's fine, so he's there if anyone else would like to meet him as well. Um, one thing I say, because because we teach very diverse across the board, um, like we might go into a school and have students with Android tablets or students mm -hmm. with iPads or students yeah. with nothing <laughs> mm -hmm. or anything. Um, I've actually found, and just because I happen to be an Apple educator, <laughs> it's nothing to do with this, but I have found the tools seem to have on iOS have gone from absolutely terrible tools to absolutely amazing tools on iOS. And the step through and the walk through on iOS is really, really good. And just the two, Pythonista and Pyto, are those two apps. Um, they're both, I think, about a tenor, something like that. And you know, uh, I just found those really good on iOS, frankly. Um, so in terms of creating resources, no more than yourselves, which is interesting, actually. Um, I create my own resources, depending on projects and things that I'm doing. or. Again, it's a little different because we're going in doing a project using that particular language with students. So I will actually create the resources and bring those in. 
um, and do the screenshots and make the PDF file and provide the PDF file and things like that. So, um, but it's interesting. We're all creating our own resources mm -hmm. for that. That's, I just find that interesting, mm -hmm. actually. That's kind of, uh, but we're all pulling from si yeah. very, very yeah. similar places. Yeah, I just think that's, that's I wonder I why. Why are we doing that? Why, uh, why, why can't we pool our resources? Yeah, I, think. I was should. just about to ask you yeah. that. that yeah. Was yeah, I think we should pool our resources, yeah. definitely. <laughs> and why we invent the wheel. Yeah. But I think for me, it's, it's because e each year I change my resources. And that is because mm. after yeah. a couple of weeks in front of your class, you see yeah. who you have yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. changing the resources yeah. to see the students in front of exactly. you and it's never the same exactly. so you're always trying to give the best to them so it's constantly changing mm. right right and plus yeah, python 2 python 3 yeah you know, i don't have to tip. yeah you know i see some of that laughing down there going yeah yeah i know i know <laughs> and, and i feel that teaching is very personal so when we are in it and we're pulling out the resources that um best enhance what we've just taught mm. I, I think it's hard to go here here's my curriculum you go teach it it doesn't work that way. So although we pull the resources that we use, giving someone else your curriculum sometimes doesn't work. I know when Sean and I were teaching, we both had the same kind of objective, but the way that Sean taught that objective was completely different than the way that I taught that objective. So it's, it's unique, but yeah, that's, I think that's why teachers pull so much of their own stuff. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the idea of sharing resources and the best way to go about doing that. Yeah. And yeah. Still. We have the people here to do it. Yeah, yeah, we certainly do. Right, I'll set up a Google Doc after this. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I think we've, we've kind of started to touch on this a little bit already, but the next thing I wanted to ask you all was that if you had a magic wand mm. and you could change one feature in Python, now I have a feeling you, you'll, you've got a sense of what you might say, Roisin, but uh, <laughs> if you could, if you, yeah, you, I think you probably have, but yeah, <laughs> if you could change one Python feature, what would it be and why? Well, I'm going to go to you first, Chris, for this. Okay. Um, very little, I have to say, very little. The, I, I've only ever had one experience, and it wasn't an educational experience, it was a corporate experience in terms of helping, in fact, not even the coding, but helping design the graphics for a project um, that was being written in Python. And we just ran into, again, I wasn't actually the coder, I wouldn't be that good of a coder to, to do what they were doing. Um, but it was, it just kept crapping out. It was a memory, memory runtime errors. It just kept going, basically, is all it was. Um, it was only ever once, to be fair. Only ever once it happened. Um, and it was a number of years ago, to be fair, as well, too. But apart from that, little enough, um, as a maker, just, I want to see, our, I want to see libraries for everything. I want to see them for micro bits. I want to see them for everything. <laughs> Absolutely everything is what I want to see them for. You know, Arduino, um, j just everything. I want a library for everything. <laughs> that's, that's, apart from that, that's all really, to be honest. Yeah, I don't, I, not, I don't asking, not asking for much. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Sarah Jane? Yeah, again, um, it, it basically does what we needed to do for the course. Oh, yeah. And personally, I'm not advanced enough yet. I'm going to say yet, still learning. Yes, exactly. This time next year, I might have a whole list. <laughs> um, but yeah, it does everything we need to do at the minute. I mean, what Roisin suggested about the helping the students uh, see what the error was mm -hmm. and not giving them the answer, but like in teaching, you have assessment of learning versus assessment for learning. Mm -hmm. So we want them to learn as they're coming into these difficulties, you know, and uh, work through it. So that, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Roisin, anything to add? Um, mm -hmm. Not really. I think I'd agree with you, Chris. I think mm -hmm. the libraries for everything are really important. I mean, the libraries, we use them all the time as well. Yeah. Um, and some of the more advanced ones for the AI, the SK Learn, and things like that, yeah. invaluable to us, absolutely invaluable. Yeah, um, but yeah, I agree. Like, there's not much I change in Python. It is. It works for us for CS1. Mm -hmm. um, the students learn very well from it. And yeah, if I had a magic wand, that would be it that mm -hmm. help them to find helps help them to sort out when they hit a bug like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I'm just checking, I'm not sure if we've lost Kelly. She's, her picture's disappeared off the screen. Mm -hmm. She's gone. Gone for the moment, anyway, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Um, great, well, we'll just give her a second. Um, yeah, no, I think, well, I'll, I'll go to the next question and we get Kelly oh, back, I'll, re I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, I'm going to start with you for this, Sarah Jane, given you're in, in classroom, you're teaching, uh, you're covering the leaving cert subject at the moment. 
What is the biggest challenge you're coming up against? I mean, I know we've touched on obviously bugs and errors and you know mm -hmm. that resilience that you're trying to help students yeah. with. But you know, anything else to add to that that is a challenge you find you're coming up against um, when you're helping students engaging with this for the first time and anything that might help overcome it? Um, yeah, well, I, I think, and I, and I mentioned it before, students who have had no experience yeah. of computers or coding. Um, so th the challenge as a teacher, and I suppose it's for every subject, is the different levels in the classroom. Um, they do find some of the core concepts are quite difficult for them to get, like something like a variable. Like mm. you, spend, you spend weeks teaching them what a variable is. Yeah, um, you know, uh, recursion, things mm. like that. But then again, the hands-on stuff really helps with that, yes. you know. Um, so when they can see it, uh, you know, and, and things like storytelling really works with that. You know, so as a teacher, you have to be a storyteller now, as well as everything else, yeah. um, to try and give them examples of, of what it means. So they're kind of what I would see in the classroom. And then there's the other issues like, yeah, and it's not to do with uh, Python or, or programming at all. It's just the access, you know. So some students wouldn't have access to a computer or something they can work on at home. Mm -hmm. So. In a school, you'll, you'll open up labs, you'll have coding clubs and things like that where they can go to. But if they can't practice it at home, um, it does make a difference. You know, for the course, they have to be doing a lot of work yeah. at home. Um, and then, yeah, I think that, that type of thing. And just the other thing is the, the self-belief. Yeah. Like, it kind of tied into the resilience. And, and again, I'm in a girls' school, right? So we're lucky we've, we've had we've a, a class a year. We had a class a year for the past four years since it started, one group and they choose it as an option for fifth year. But the self-belief that they can do it, like I would get students into the class and they're all different, you know, walks of life, different shapes and sizes, different groups, you know, in, in high school you have, in America you yeah. see the films with all the different gangs and all the different <laughs> types, it's not as marked here or something, but um, we have different people from all kind of walks of life and some of them, like have no idea what a coder looks like mm -hmm. you know or they have a specific idea of what a coder looks like and that's not what it is at all so you find a lot of the time you're trying to tell them no you, you can actually do this sure look what you did that's amazing keep at it and and that uh challenge of not feeling bad when they fail yeah so that takes a while at the start when they come in. Yep. You're trying to make them see that it's okay, and you're, you can't. You have your posters up. If we haven't failed, we're not learning. Mm -hmm. You know, the right answer. To, if you haven't done it a thousand times and then got to the answer, you're doing it wrong. You know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and that takes a while to work up. But now we're at it in school. For, we've had it in school for four years. So I think that's breaking down a bit. Yeah. Um, so those are kind of, I mean, again, it's not Python related, but, you know, they're the But it's relevant to yeah. the subject overall, isn't it? And yeah. keeping that interest up and, yeah, that in, exactly. and instilling that kind of yeah. confidence. And in the, the success, city. like building in success. Yeah. That's why Python is really good for that, because you can show them what success will look like and they can get success with a program really quickly, mm -hmm. you know, yep. whereas some of the other languages, they might it'd take them a long time. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Kelly, I think we might have, you might have dropped out, and so I'll just repeat the question so you're not um, wondering, what, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about just the biggest challenge that you find that students face when you're, when you're covering Python with them for the first time, um, and you know, what might help overcome it. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on you know, the positives <laughs> as well as the negatives. Absolutely. So um, the biggest thing is that power of yet. Um, mm. We like to talk about the mindset a lot. Mm, yeah. And of course, the sixth, the sixth graders, the year tens, uh, the ten-year-olds that come in, they're happy and excited. You get them to print hello. Their mindset is still positive. They still have this imagination and this ability to, I can do anything. But as you start to get older, um, the 13, 14, 15-year-olds, they start to understand that I'm not as good as as so and so next to me and this mindset of I can't, I, I can't do it, um, I can't code, I'm not a coder, I can't do math. And so we work a lot on that power of yet and we talk about climbing the steps and saying that, you know, we're here at the top and I can't answer all the questions either yet, but one day I will. And, and we talk a lot about just saying, change that, that word, I can't code, and add in the sentence, I can't code yet. yet. Mm -hmm. And it is, a, it is a good struggle, but it's not just coding that it applies to. So in our classroom, it's not just about learning how to use Python, because Python, God forbid, um, will be gone in you know, 20 years, and they have to learn another language, or they might be doing some other thing. 
um, they need to be able to overcome whatever challenge mm -hmm. is put in front of them. And by having an open mindset, a positive mindset, that's going to help them regardless if they're playing basketball, mm -hmm. they're doing geometry, they're studying for an AP physics exam. They may not be able to accomplish it, but they will do it one day. Mm -hmm. So. I really like that thought. It's very uplifting. And I, I was one of those students not good at maths, technology. Yeah, scary. You know, some of that thinking would have really helped me along the way if it had if it, if it had been happening. How about you, Roisin, any further to add? I'm really excited to hear Sarah Jane and Kelly speak um, because uh, I've been involved, as I said, primary, secondary, mostly third level. By the time I get them in third level, we have huge problems, especially with females with imposter syndrome. They feel they can't do it. They feel they're not as good as the boys and um, we need to catch that earlier. Mm. So it makes me so happy, Kelly, to hear that you're working on it and then Sarah Jane. And I know with CS Inc, I'm trying to work on that too. And it's about kind of breaking down those uh, perceptions. And as you said, the I can't, it's just I can't yet. And seeing that sometimes I can't, do you know, whether mm -hmm. Kelly can't or that Sarah Jane can't, and that, that that's okay, we're all still learning, it's, it's a journey. Um, so yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think um, that, is, that is very much a challenge, and at the moment it's a huge challenge in third level um, in particular. Interesting, just some of the research I've been involved in, um, female students' self-efficacy, which is the same thing, um, is, is, is lower than males. But, and this is the big but, the, stu the female students who stick out the degree outperform the males traditionally by the end of it. So very interesting statistics. So if we can get them to believe in themselves, mm -hmm. they have the potential to go very, very, very far. Um, and that's just some education research I'm involved in. And then I think the other more mundane challenges that we have, and again, not directly related to Python, but it's always those threshold concepts mm -hmm. in first year. So it's the ifs and the loops would be the two big ones. And then when you move into maybe second year, it's moving into more object oriented and what is an object. And um, that could be in Python or any language, it doesn't matter, but if the Python community could help with um, improving or helping us with uh, educating students around those threshold concepts, that would be very welcomed as well. Great, so yeah, all of your uh, suggestions were welcome. We're looking forward to hearing them afterwards, so thank you. Chris, uh, any more on that with regards to maybe maker projects and- Yeah, you know... I mean, it's a bigger discussion and I would sit here all day talking about it. Um, but in terms of what everyone else has said, I can only repeat it probably not as good, especially in terms of gender encoding. Um, I'm a guy, I code, fine. But I'm a maker, first and foremost. And in terms of quote unquote failing at doing something, it's a mindset, it's a systemic mindset, mm. not only in, I would say, probably almost every education system on the planet, but in society as well. And it's women that unfortunately suffer at that mindset. And I'm gonna say that bluntly, as a man. And it shouldn't be that way mm -hmm. under any circumstances. I won't relay the story that we were talking about earlier because it's something upset me. <laughs> but the reality is, is that it's not about the code. It's not about the job, and this is me speaking with my maker hat on. It's about the feeling you all get when you finish a project or when a bit of code works. And that's a good feeling. It's a positive feeling. And that, as a maker, is, in my opinion, how it should go through if you make pasta. <laughs> <laughs> and you burn the pasta, that's fine. You failed burning the pasta, just make it again. And remember, it's only 20 minutes, not 40 minutes, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The same is true for code. We've all failed at making code, that's okay. But let's encourage other people, everybody, to let's help them get through that and do it. And that's a maker mindset. It's not exclusively a maker mindset by any stretch of the imagination. But it's just the mindset of 
trying to be inclusive of everybody. That because it's better for the community. No more, as Kelly was saying, in terms as we're all saying, in terms of the community. Like the Python community is really an amazing community. It genuinely is. And why can't we share that? I think we should share that. In fact, not only share it, I think we should teach other people how good this community is. And I just feel that that's really important. I just think that's really important. I know it's kind of vaguely off topic. I was going to talk about syntax and stuff. But like, no, but you know, I, I started getting stuck into that, sorry. But I just, I really do genuinely think in terms of that, um, it's just, it's extremely, extremely important. It's extremely important. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that, Chris. I, um, I, can I just add real quick? Please. Um, going in about that, that mindset, I think it's also that hook, that getting that fail turned into a positive. Yeah. It's those positive endorphins mm -hmm. that that's the challenge, another big challenge that I have in the middle school, because I want them to go on to secondary school and I want them mm -hmm. to go into the career. But it's, it's my job, I feel it's my job to find that thing that makes them have those positive endorphins. So if it means that one child is doing ear sketch in music and another child is making something in cardboard like a basketball game with the micro bit and another child's doing something on Circuit Python, my classroom's chaotic and I have a headache when I go home, but, but those kids are finding their, their endorphin lighter. And, and they're getting, they're getting that stuff that we get when we solve problems. Mm -hmm. And that's what it means to, to fail and, and move on. Because failing and failing and having those negative endorphins doesn't help anyone. And that mm -hmm. is a challenge sometimes when people pick up coding. Mm -hmm. So finding those libraries, those things that make them, you know, that glint in their eyes when they're smiling and saying, look what I made. <laughs> that's a challenge <laughs> for every teacher, I think. I love that, Kelly. We, we, we talk about this all the time in the Microbit Foundation, and we call it the Microbit moment, like that first exposure where you've, you're, you're, you've coded something, and then you've downloaded it to Microbit, and it, 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 it does the thing. And <laughs> I, I remember the first time I had that experience, and I was at a bet show like years ago, and I was like so excited. So you know that, but it doesn't have to be that device. We were talking about this earlier, Chris, around it's device agnostic. It's that feeling almost, isn't it, that you're, you're creating that feeling in whether it's maker projects, it's in third level, it could be wherever, but you're, it's about kind of capturing that feeling, isn't it, and helping or, others or to Or pasta, right? <laughs> or pasta, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm coming to your house for pasta, Chris, now, to be honest. But, uh... It doesn't matter, I tell you, it doesn't matter what you do, what you make, you're a maker, no matter what you make. You're absolutely, a maker. absolutely. No, I think that this is, this is, it's really fascinating. I think what I'd like to kind of move on to now just is we're talking a lot about what we can do as a community of Python and educa educators, but I wonder about policy makers and actual systemic change that we've been talking about being so necessary. Um, obviously, Sarah Jane, you've been heavily involved in the Leaving Cert subject. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you, all, you all have your own uh, hand act to play in, 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 in the way that these things are happening, but I wonder from a policy point of view, what, what, needs, what needs to happen or what, what can be done you know, at this stage to improve things from that kind of systemic point of view? Yeah, see, it's, it's um, that's a difficult one because again, you could, you should have asked me to prepare that question if I could do, wish for anything. I want computer science to be in every single school. I yeah. want science to be compulsory in every yeah. single school. Um, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, at the minute there is a there's a there's not enough teachers um, to teach computer science, and that's yeah. that's an issue. So, you know, if anyone here would like to be a teacher it's of okay. computer science, look into it. You know, there are loads of courses you could do it outside of your working life. Um, I, I think it, there, there, there is a lot of work being done, like um, coding and computational thinking is being introduced at primary mm -hmm. school level, and that's filtering through into secondary school, which is great. Yeah. Coding is a new junior, well, newish junior cycle subject. Computer science is a brand new subject. It's just to keep it, to keep the momentum up. Now, obviously, COVID hit in the mm -hmm. middle of it, but you know, to try and get it into every school and to get teachers interested in teaching it mm -hmm. um, and students and parents to realize that it's not just, in terms of careers, it's not just one particular mm -hmm. picture of somebody sitting on a computer all day. Like it's such a va it can open up a vast world. Mm -hmm. And there are countries all over the world now who are introducing just computational thinking yeah. to every student, never yeah. mind the coding, just yeah. the mindset around yeah. it, you know, and even, in terms of 21st century skills, mm -hmm. like the Python community embodies the 21st century skill of collaboration, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like just the fact that 
you're this massive group working together to promote the subject. We're trying to bring that into every subject, every classroom mm -hmm. the whole time. So it is quite difficult, but I mean, you know, that would be my policy change. It would be that computer science is offered in every school. Yeah. <laughs> We'll reflect on you saying that one day, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> it's but, not being recorded. Nobody <laughs> seen it. I remember yeah. when Sarah Jane no, told us. we're yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> we will, but remember this date, everybody. No, how, how about you, Roisin, from your point yeah, of view in third level? I definitely would agree. Um, I think we need definitely need more teachers. Um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest problems mm -hmm. with the computer science leaving cert. But also, I've worked very hard through CS Inc. to try and change perceptions mm -hmm. of computer science. Yeah. Um, from pri a primary and secondary level and we need help with that like we're one small group of five people working out of TU Dublin we've traveled all around the country we've reached 10,000 10, students over three years which is great but it's still not enough and mm. um, work has to be done on this to break down the perceptions around computer science so that it does become more open, more equal, more diverse, because we need everybody involved in it. Um, so I think that's that's definitely something that uh, is huge for me. Um, in terms of policy, I mean, I think the Department of Education has an excellent policy in the Leaving mm -hmm. Certificate Curriculum. Um, one of their quotes is uh, computers for all, and I think mm -hmm. that's really important. And I think we have to always remember that there's always the risk with the Leaving Cert that it becomes an extra subject or yeah. the subject for after school for the elite students. Mm -hmm. it can, we have to work really hard to make sure that isn't the case. It has to be uh, for all. And then I know my colleague Keith Quill is working very hard in the background too to draw up kind of a policy and procedures for bringing this into primary school. Mm -hmm. Chris, you'll be happy yeah. to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that's, so I think we need the pipeline there. I think we meet, yeah. need to look at primary school. Start early. Yeah, 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 and even though the coding is there for junior cycle, because it's not part of the formal curricula, yeah. that can also pose a problem because not everybody has to do that or it's not open to everybody. And sometimes those extra courses, while they're very valuable for people who are interested in them, it's those perceptions, I'm not interested, I'm a girl you know we need yeah. to expose them to these so I think it's coming I think it's 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 on its way but I think we need a kind of a joined up thinking now between mm -hmm. the Department of Education third level and industry and second and primary level as well mm -hmm. to join up and, and push this through to make sure that um, we have a, a fully uh, ecosystem in our education mm -hmm. system from from primary right through and, and primary that can be cross curricular like what you were saying it's, it doesn't have to be computer science it can be you know um computers in geography computers yeah. for history mm. climate. yeah climate yeah. change looking at all of these different things so i mean there's no reason why uh, we can't bring this in across the full range of our educational yeah. system i'm very passionate yeah. about that absolutely no and and kelly i'll come to you as well obviously with the us perspective and there's great work going on obviously code.org csda mm. but you know what what would you like to see more of or from an international point of view you know how can we all help well having having taught in london and 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 south america and the us it's it's pretty much worldwide mm. the the same and i could go on and on about the needs of education and computer science but i'll stick only for what the python community <laughs> can do for us i i mirror all the comments um definitely finding teachers that can do the job and getting teachers out of that mindset of um, I'm a science teacher because I'm a biology major um, and I teach code. So I think we need to tap into those risk takers, those teachers that like to problem solve um, in their curricular activities and, and move them into code. And I think it, it mirrors what some of the talks that we saw yesterday. Um, Sarvasta, he made a, a really good point that we need to break down that stigma that computer science only works in the computer classroom. Why is that? Um, we read across the curriculum, we do math across the, across the curriculum, we, we can bring social studies across the curriculum or you know civics across the curriculum. Why can't we bring code across the curriculum? So many areas where um, math and, and code and even coding the constitution, we, I attempted that, that wasn't very successful, but coding the constitution in, allows those students to break down the, the problems. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think that the Python community can do is really be that um, 
that source to get the teacher that's not a coder into coding. And I remember the first year at PyCon, I had been coding only six months and everyone was so welcoming. And I kept saying, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here with all these smart people. But, but why is that? Why is that that's the initial feeling when you get into code? I think that needs to break down. Yes, we are all smart people, but everybody's smart in their own sense. And, mm -hmm. and if we work hard at something, we all can code. And I think that needs to be pushed, that it's not just these smart people that go to these great colleges and take computer science all their life and play computer, with computers all their life. It's everyone can do it if they want to. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my plea for the Python community. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. And Chris, yeah. some thoughts on, on Yeah, I definitely echo all of that. Um, and I'm, I'm absolutely heartened to hear Kelly saying that she's teaching Python to, you know, 10-year-olds and things like that. Again, exactly as Roshan said as well, and it's great that, you know, that you guys are doing that work in order to bring it back. Um, because I just think it's a situation, and that's kind of what we do as well, too. You know, I actually don't think it's about the code. As I kind of said before, I think it's about mindsets, as you were saying, and it's about um, problem solving. It's about critical thinking. It's about lots of other things. All those skills are coding skills, but they're not just coding skills. <laughs> those, as you said, Kelly, those are what are required across the curriculum. And I normally speak from the bottom up, if that makes sense. But Amy and I had this talk from the top down from industry. There's a lot of companies, industry leaders, that do not want clones of everybody anymore. They, because it costs them a lot of money to hire and then rehire three months, six months, 18 months, whatever it is, and rehire those people. That costs companies money. But if you have an employee who has a diverse range of skills that is based in critical thinking, mm -hmm. then that those employees are much more valuable to the company. So if the company changes direction in a year or two years or the third quarter of 2025 or whatever it is, then those employees can be kept on and there's no need to retrain or rehire. And that's really important. And as a systemic change, I think those companies need to speak to government and third level institutions to try to engineer that change and push it down all the way to primary schools so that those critical thinking skills, those 21st century skills, those maker skills, whatever you want, are employed across the board in every single subject because they're valuable in every subject. Mm -hmm. Are they valuable in coding? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're a coder, and I'm sure many of you are, if you're a Python coder, how many other languages do you know? I would suspect most of you know other languages apart from Python. That makes you a much more valuable employee to a company you're working for if you're working for a company. That makes you much more valuable. But imagine if you take those critical thinking skills and say, well, yes, I can drive a forklift. I can crunch a spreadsheet of numbers. I can do whatever. So you're not just coders. You have other valuable skills. And I think that needs to be pushed from corporate down. That's my, that's my point. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and I think that point around improving diversity in, in this space right the way through in research, in third level, in primary, in teaching, um, that kind of message really would really land, I can imagine, yeah. where you're thinking, right, I'm good at, there's certain things you can learn, there's certain things you've got a natural aptitude for, and yeah. I think it, it's less scary, I think, if you, if you yeah. open people's eyes to that, you know, you can see possibilities for themselves. And I think it's, yeah. it's in, um, incumbent on us all, I suppose, to think about those messages and how they get out there. You know, mm. we do it, obviously, within the foundation, but it's, you know, you've got a, you've got a lot of influencing to do around with parents, obviously, mm. with, you know, head teachers, as I'm mm. sure you've, you've done. Mm. Um, I'm conscious of time, and we, I, I could obviously sit here all day having this wonderful conversation, but um, I think we should definitely go for some questions now from the audience. I think remotely, uh, we, I'm not sure how we will see them, but they might, <laughs> nope. No. Okay, well then, I think, guys, if anyone has any questions, there's a microphone right there, uh, so please don't be shy. Come on up and 
uh, ask a question to the group. Yes, please. Hi, thank you so much for the panel. It was really interesting. Um, I'm a civil engineer and a Python developer, and in my department, in my work, I act as a teacher of Python many times, and I get a lot of questions. So I'm really interested in the, the things uh, you mentioned of not answering the questions and letting uh, the students uh, find out by themselves. Do you have maybe a rule of thumb that you can apply when to answer, when not to answer? Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's a really difficult question <laughs> because every student is different. So mm. um, I think right back to the primary school rule of three, uh, three before me. So have you tried three things? Have yeah. you checked the web? Have you traced through your code? Have you So three things yeah. before you come to me. And at that point then potentially, again, I, th don't, I think it's more valuable that they see it themselves so maybe not give an answer but direct you know towards yeah. this uh, piece of code seems to be causing the problem in this area have another look mm. so always be pushing them towards solving it themselves um, I, 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 and i and i'm in a classroom of 40 or 50 students on my own for one hour i make the mistake of going oh look he just misses a semicolon next person yeah, i'm yeah. always doing that but <laughs> Theoretically, it's not the, the best way to do it. So I would always try and, uh, ha and help each other. Mm. So if they do team coding or if there's a buddy system in the organization, that always works really well as well. And um, because they're in it together and then that person has shown me and then I find something else, I'll show to them. So mm. that kind of works, mm. I hope. Yeah. Sorry, I jumped in yeah. to answer that there. Does anyone want yeah. That's great. I, I can answer help. Uh, uh, um, I always say Google's your friend, obviously. That's your first source, but we talk about keywords. And I forgot, to, I was reminded to mention that all the work that um, Andre Robert is doing on the friendly tracebacks. So a lot of the times when students come to me, I make them read the traceback out loud. Um, it sounds like a little childish thing, but uh, Sean always did it to me. He's like, what does a traceback say? How, what words can you pull from that traceback? Mm -hmm. And now that they're, the tracebacks are a lot clearer, um, you can have the students or the learners, adult learners even, what are the keywords in that, in that error? Is it a syntax error? Where is it pointing? Um, mm -hmm. And I find that just having them read out loud helps them to start to Sorry. think about the solution right away. And yes, it is the hardest thing not to give the answer because you know you've said it and you can see the, the problem right there in their face, but they will never learn and do it at sometimes, home if you sometimes. help them. Resist the temptation. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll go to the next question. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much. I'm, I'm a teacher as well. And um, what you were saying in starting about Python being a nice beginner's language, I think is, is true. Um, when I come to a conference like this and find out some of the really complex things that Python can do, and that, that's great as well. But I, I, I sometimes struggle with the kind of the middle ground. How do you get students from kind of the prints and simple loops and things onto things like um, you know GUIs and um, the more the more tricky things? Have you got any recommendations for sort of good intermediate steps which they can take? That's, that's a perennial problem that we have in TU Dublin. So we would teach uh, Python in first year and then we jump to the Django framework in second year. And it's something that we're currently reconsidering because as you know, we have somebody going from kind of console based output and then trying to integrate to a framework with GUIs and output. It's such a big leap, so um, it, it, isn't an e it isn't an easy answer. Um, I think that um, it's more about how you introduce those as opposed to, uh, I think it has to be done. So I think our leap from first year to second year still has to be done, but I think it's how you introduce that. And um, maybe taking um, smaller steps, so we kind of go straight from the console to the framework, maybe bringing in the GUI before that and then the framework. But, uh, to be totally honest, there's no golden answer for that one. It's it's yeah. tricky. Packaging Passion. would be another way. Do you know packaging yeah, putting, packaging yeah, your yeah. Python to into an app, depending on what you're doing, obviously. But yeah. do you know to try and introduce? Okay, you're going to build an app. You're going to build a self-running app. 
and then now you have to package that and, and attach the graphics to it, the GUI, you're gonna attach everything to it. And that can be a little bit intimidating as well. But yeah, I would agree with you, Russian. There's no, yeah. it's difficult, yeah, it is difficult. I generally at the lower, I say lower end, I don't mean lower end, but I'm generally at the primary, secondary end, so I don't often encounter that. But I would say I do know um, in terms of sometimes doing things, my experience has just been when I'm starting Python or when I'm f doing Python with students and things, it's to a specific goal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that goal, Python is not is not the correct language to use. So what I might then is say, okay, well look, you've used Python, you're vaguely familiar with it, let's try a different language that might achieve this goal better. And that can be a whole nother thing, but then I'm not in a classroom situation, mm -hmm. so it's a very different thing as well. The other thing that does tie things together very well for them is the projects. I don't know if you do any of that, but the project work um, in terms of uh, ha having a set goal, so they define their project, and I think that that really helps. And I think once they define the project and the outline of it, then as educators, we can direct them to the pathway to integrate more GUIs and the database at the back end, the front end, and the coding in the middle. And I think we can, we can, they're more engaged in it because it's their idea, and that helps a lot as well. Hundred percent. Great. Thank you so much. And one, and one last question. Yeah, uh, thank yeah, you. Uh, getting the students to install stuff for their lessons on their machines can take up a whole lesson. Um, what are your strategies for, I guess, picking whether you do everything in the browser on a lesson or whether you get them to install things locally? I'll take that if, if you yeah, want. Yeah, please, yeah. Kelly, yes. Um, so the very first lesson I have with sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, mostly seventh and eighth, um, is investigating their editor and what they're gonna use. And they always have to have two choices, one that's online um, and one that is local on their, on their desktop. So we try, I try to do the screen, a screencast and we use Moo Editor at our school most of the time. So we do a screencast and I try to get the students to do it at home because obviously it's going to upload faster when they, they have everything uploaded at home. And then we also use CoLab, uh, which is an online sort of Jupyter notebook. And some students also will choose Replit. So having those two locals and something that they have on the cloud can help. So when, for example, a computer breaks or they have to borrow a computer from their mom or dad, they have an option that is online and they can still work with. Um, so that's what we do. Agreed, actually, same. Yeah. yeah, pretty much the same as well. Like, we would have used very much um, kind of like Tony and PyCharm traditionally, but COVID has just changed everything, and we have to be, have to have availability online um, for students and staff so that in the event that I'm teaching in a classroom and half of my students are at home, that they can complete the coursework as well. So, yeah, it's very much mixed now. Yeah, we'd be the same except for the, uh, the actual exam. So the Leaving Cert exam is done on a computer. Um, but they can't have any internet access, so mm. so they have to know how to use Tony. You know, they have to have yeah. seen it um, before the end. But we'd have the same. We'd have a couple of things on the go. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that takes us up to time. Um, thank you all very much for your questions, and an enormous thank you to Chris, Kelly, Sarah Jane, and Roisin for your perspectives. Um, I'm sure there's lots of food of food for thought for all the members of the audience and all the things you were, you were sharing with us today. And, and thank you, Kelly, for joining us remotely. Um, you are very much here. Uh, it feels like you're sitting with us in Dublin. So <laughs> thank you uh, we so hope much. to see you. Go watch Kelly's podcast. You. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Check out Teaching Python podcast for sure. Um, but yes, thank you all so much. And thanks to Europython and the organizers. This has been very straightforward, um, which has been a very nice thing. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you all for being here. And a round of applause for so our lovely panelists. And for Amy as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.